tonight is Asalaha Bucha. Asalaha is the name of the month. The Bucha means homage. Of course, we're not paying homage to the month. We're recalling an event that happened on this full moon night, soon after the Buddha's awakening. He had spent seven weeks experiencing the bliss of awakening. And then the question came to his mind, is there anyone out there who he could teach to find awakening as well? At first he was a little discouraged because it was a very subtle thing. They had taken all of his effort, all of his intelligence to find it. And he was afraid that trying to teach other people would be a waste of time. There was a Brahma who read what was going on in the Buddha's mind, and he was concerned. If all the Buddha had gone to all that trouble to become Buddha, here he's going to give up on teaching. So he came down and invited the Buddha and said, There are beings with little dust in their eyes. They will understand the Dhamma. And as the Buddha reflected, he realized that this was true, so he decided to teach. His first thought was to teach his two previous teachers, but then he realized that both of them had passed away. So the next thought was to teach the five brethren who had helped him when he was going through his period of austerities. And so from there he walked all the way to Sarnath. It must have taken about a week. When he arrived there, the five brethren had decided he had given up on the practice and he had been eating after many years of starving himself, and they thought he'd gone into a phase of luxury. So at first they weren't interested in listening to what he had to say. But he said, look, I found the deathless, and I've never said anything like this before, have I? And they realized that no, he'd never made that statement. So they're more willing to listen. And so he gave his first talk. It's called Setting the Wheel of Dharma in Motion. And as a result of the talk, it turned out that, yes, one of those brethren did have little dust in his eyes. Anya Gontanya. His name originally, originally was just Gontanya. He got what is called the, the Dharma eye, seeing that whatever is subject to origination, in other words, whatever has causes, is also subject to passing away. Now, that vision or that understanding comes from seeing what doesn't arise and what's not caused and, what, and therefore doesn't pass away. That was the deathless. And so in seeing the deathless, he became the first member of the Noble Sangha. Which is why we say that that event was when the Triple Gem became complete. The Dharma cross was already there. The Buddha had become a refuge on the night of his awakening. And now we have the Sangha. So tonight we're celebrating many things. The fact that the Buddha's Dharma was effective and that there have been people who have carried it on from that time to the present moment, both by memorizing the teachings and by putting them into practice. And this is what we're paying homage to, the events of that night and also the continuity that's kept that memory alive, that's kept that practice alive. Because one of the purposes of paying homage here is so that we can continue keeping that practice alive ourselves. That phrase, setting the Dharma wheel in motion, comes from a part of the talk where the Buddha talks about the Four Noble Truths. He starts out originally by talking about the Eightfold Path. Then he starts explaining right view, which is seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. And then he goes on to say that there's actually three levels of knowledge regard, with regard to those truths. There's one, the knowledge of what the truth is. And the first truth is dukkha, suffering, stress. And the Buddha gives examples, birth, aging, illness, or stress. Not getting what you want is stress. Having to be with what you don't like is stress. Having to be separated from what you do like is stress. 
Then he summarizes it all as the five aggregates when you cling to them are stress. The clinging to the aggregates is the stress. That's knowing the truth. The second one is level of knowledge here is knowing there's a duty with regard to the truth. You don't just know these things, you actually act on them. In this case, you try to comprehend it when there actually is stress. And we're not here talking about the words, we're talking about the actual experience of stress and suffering in the mind. If you want to get beyond it, you have to comprehend it. And most of us don't care about comprehending stress, we just want to get away from it. You can see why the Buddha was a little discouraged about teaching, because he's teaching people to go against the grain. Most of us don't want to deal with mental pain, we don't want to deal with suffering. We either push it away or run away from it. But he says you've got to stay with it long enough so you can comprehend it. In other words, seeing that it is just clinging to these five things, your form of the body, your feelings, your perceptions, mental fabrications, consciousness. The fact that we cling to it, that's the suffering. The third level of knowledge is when you know that you've comprehended the suffering fully. Now that level doesn't come until you've completed the duties for the other th three Noble Truths as well. In fact, all of them come together at that point. The second Noble Truth is the cause of suffering, it comes from craving, specifically the kinds of craving that lead to becoming, taking on an identity in a world of experience, okay? seeing that you have a desire in this particular world and you've got the identity that's going to try to fulfill that desire and enjoy it. It comes from sensuality. Or just the desire to take on an identity, or when you decide you don't like the identity you have, you want to destroy it, well, you become a destroyer, and that's taking on an identity, too. That's something you want to abandon. That's the duty there. That's the second level of knowledge. And then the third level of knowledge, of course, will be knowing that you had abandoned it fully. The third noble truth is the cessation of stress and suffering. And that comes from totally abandoning and relinquishing any of the cravings that would lead to suffering. In other words, you attack the problem by attacking the cause. And this is something you want to fully comprehend, fully realize. In other words, you have to see it happening. Because all too often we drop one craving simply because we want to go to another one. We don't really realize what's going on. So again, this is something that goes against the grain. And then finally, there's the path to the end of suffering, the Eightfold Path, and that's to be developed. As you work on comprehending suffering, you need to develop the path, because the path includes right mindfulness and right concentration. Without the stability that comes from right concentration, without the clarity that comes from right mindfulness, you wouldn't be able to stay with suffering long enough to comprehend it. So these truths, as you work on their duties, begin to come together until finally it all becomes one, like the spokes of a wheel coming into join in a hub. Now this is called a wheel because in those days when you ever had different sets of variables that you ran against each other, and you went through all the permutations, that was what they called a wheel. It's like you're going around the horizon, covering all the alternatives. So in this case, the Buddha listed the Four Noble Truths and listed the three levels of knowledge with regard to each. Twelve permutations altogether, that's the wheel. The important thing here, of course, is realizing that these are truths that carry duties. You don't just know them and figure out that that's enough. Because the truth of stress, the truth of suffering, is something that eats away at the mind. It doesn't let you just sit there and know about it. This is why the Buddha said our duty is to comprehend it. So as you learn these truths, you try to figure out how you can implement that duty. Usually the first focus, of course, is developing the path. Like we're doing right now, we're trying to develop right concentration, taking themes of right mindfulness in terms of the body or feelings, mind states. Focusing on these in and of themselves, not worried about the world outside. Just focusing on what it's, is it like to have a body, what is it like to have feelings and mind states. 
when you look at these things directly, you begin to see that some feelings, for example, are skillful and some are not. Some mind states are skillful. In other words, pursuing a particular feeling would be skillful. Some pleasures, when you pursue them, are good for the mind. Some pleasures are bad. Some pains, when you pursue them, are bad for the mind. Some are good. So you need the discernment to figure out which is which. The same with different mind states. If your mind is scattered all over the place, that's something you want to abandon. If it's sluggish and sleepy, okay, you want to abandon that too. You've got to figure out some way to get beyond that. You don't just sit there and watch these things arise and pass away. There's a duty with regard to them. We do that with ardency. Now the ardency here is, is the wisdom, realizing you don't just sit there and let these things happen. The wise thing to do is to try to abandon unskillful qualities and develop skillful ones. When the Buddha mentioned his categorical teachings, there are only two. The Four Noble Truths is one, and then the principle that skillful qualities are to be developed and unskillful ones are to be abandoned. That's the second categorical teaching. In both cases, there's duties involved. You don't just know about these things. You realize that the unskillful qualities and the suffering they cause are eating away at the mind, and you don't want to just leave it there. You want to find some way to get out. This is the inspiring part of the Buddha's teachings, is his unwillingness to just sit there with what most people expect, accept. You say, well, that's just the way things are, trying to find happiness in the world as it is. Don't try too hard, you can wear yourself out, that kind of thing. The Buddha was unwilling to accept that as a noble life. He saw that if it's possible for human beings through their efforts to find a noble happiness, then it's a waste of your life not to do that. And even in his case, he wasn't, didn't have any guarantees or no examples that told him that this could be done, but he said at least trying would be a noble activity. We now, of course, have his example. We have the example of the Noble Sangha. The Dharma has been taught to us in a lot of detail. So are we going to follow it? Are we going to take on the duties that the Dharma recommends? That's our choice. If you want your life to be a noble life, that's, then you follow the Buddha's example. It's another reason why we try to rec recollect these events every year, to make sure that our compass is pointing in the right direction. We don't suddenly give up and say, well, I'd just rather go halfway or take the easy path. What we think is the easy path is really hard. I mean, you think of all the suffering that comes from beings who don't follow the path. That Dharma eye, that Anya Kotanya gained that night. As the Buddha said, once you've had that experience, the amount of suffering left for you in the round of rebirth is like the dirt under your fingernails compared with the dirt in the world, which is the amount of suffering that faces people who haven't had that experience. It's truly liberating, even that much. And it's something that's not only for monks, it's for all people who have decided they've had enough of the sufferings and the ordinary way of living in the world. Gained a sense of what, what the Buddha calls sangwega, or terror over the, the sufferings that are involved if you just think you're going to take what you think is the easy way. The truly pleasant way is the noble path, even when it's difficult. It's asking you to do things that are noble. And so we want to keep these things in mind. That's why we have the anusaranta in the chant we had just now. We're rec recollecting these things to make sure that our lives are lived in light of the Buddha's discovery in light of the fact that not only did he discover the end to suffering, he was able to teach it to others, and other people were able to practice. So these are things that should inform our own practice to help us make sure that we're on the right track. 
and that we don't fall off. <laughs>